everyone and welcome to yet another episode of the Inspiring Leaders and Leadership Podcast by Advantage Club. My name is Smriti and I'm one of the founders of Advantage Club, which is a global employee engagement, rewards, recognition and community platform. Today we have uh, another awesome person joining us. We have Mukul Harish Chopra, who is the CHRO of Conway Genius, uh, here with us today. Hi, Mukul. Thank you very much for having me on this show, Smithy. And I think I will live up to your expectations of this show. Okay. No, absolutely. And we're really excited to have you here as well. So uh, let's start off uh, with just telling the audience a little bit about you, about your background with what you do and also your journey into becoming mm. a Chief Human Resources Officer. Okay. So... Um, my father is ex forces. He was in the army. So resultantly, uh, I changed five boards before I did my 10th. Okay. I still don't know how to do logs. So, but traversed across the country. Uh, then, you know, 12th, uh, brutally speaking, uh, the choice was between medical and non-medical because that's what boys were supposed to do. And I computed that, you know, it takes eight years to do your medical and four years to do your engineering. So I chose engineering. Uh, engineering then, you know, it was about streams. So it was like, okay, become a mechanical engineer because every industry has a machine and you'll never be unemployed. So that's how I did my mechanical. And uh, four years into my mechanical and after I graduated out, I still didn't know how a spark plug works. <laughs> okay. Yet, unlike others, I wanted to still try my hands. So my first job was in Bombay, uh, in the steel industry. Uh, I got a campus placement with Jinders, went to Bombay, worked there for two years, then came back and did my MBA. So I'd been like a traditional kite flying against the wind. So instead of doing the normal uh, BE MBA marketing, which was the flavor of the season at that point of time, I did it in human resources. And uh, so the biggest challenge I had during my pre placement talk was that people could not fathom that why, for the love of God, being an engineer, I did my HR. Okay. So I, I think my company dropped because of this uh, simple thing that, you know, uh, how can this guy do HR? after doing his engineering and uh, but through campus I got into telecom so SR telecom was my first uh, assignment three years with SR three years then with Bharti uh, Reliance then uh, the GE stint Huawei uh, yeah, lost count but just like my dad got transferred after every three years I guess I've been moving around so uh, this happens to be my latest stint uh, which is into a tech now, and here I am. So that's in short a journey. Uh, happily married, the wife's happy and married, two sons who think nothing of me, but oh, that's how it is. Okay. Uh, but yes, life's been kind, life's been good. Uh, I've worked with a lot of people across uh, nationalities, across sectors. Uh, across age groups now, okay. I, I started being uh, the youngest in my group to get elevated to a national head, to then reporting into a person who was, uh, I mean, I have to take the reporting of people who were, you know, junior to me in age, and then uh, reporting into people who were in their diapers when I did my engineering. So I guess, when a child is the father of man, well, that's all. I guess I'm living up to it. So. That, that's amazing. And uh, what I've also noticed is that, you know, uh, especially as a child, if uh, you're in a background where you're changing a lot of boards, uh, you also become a better people person because you're switching so many schools, you're switching so many boards. And as a child, of course, that's a very challenging thing, right? And uh, you you also become very adaptable to different types of scenarios, different types of, because you're doing multiple types of courses and every board is very different from each. Plus, you know, school switches also make you very adaptable to change in terms of the people around you. So I think that's, that's really helpful for the growth of the child to like a successful person in the future too. 
You're right, Smithies. You know, um, I, 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 I put it as four A's. You know, and I, 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 it's, it's my, you know, it's one of my favorite this thing to quote about. See, uh, in organizations today, uh, firstly, ambiguity is here to stay. You don't know what is next. Okay, uh, it's the agility with which you adopt to this ambiguity. Uh, it's also adaptability, okay? And ultimately it's your ability. So I've lived through this as a child. You know, we never knew what was in store. My dad had no forecast of which station he would go into, you know? Um, so I, I, when I did my 10th, I did it from Maharashtra board, okay? Uh, we never thought, uh, so there Marathi was a third language. Okay? I never thought I'll do my boards from there. We thought we'll get posted out. But Marathi it was. And uh, I realized I never studied Marathi. So I took Sanskrit. Okay, Just because I had studied Sanskrit in fifth or sixth, it was assumed that I would do that. But I couldn't find a teacher. Then ultimately I found a teacher who could only speak from Sanskrit to Marathi. And then there would be a translator who would speak from Marathi to Hindi. And my dad, I think, puffed almost two packs that day. The day I gave my Sanskrit paper. And when my result came out, you know, I was, I mean, it came by the postal this thing. So my dad took it and he went out, saw it. He saw that I'd passed and he was like, really, really, they came and gave me a hug because he thought I would fail for sure. Okay. So, uh, so when you go through this childhood, you know, um, what people now say about, you know, uh, my God, it's this thing. So I said, well, I've, I've lived it almost daily. Okay. Uh, I've had these fears. So uh, I think today a successful, <laughs> to be successful, I think you should have the ability to do the incredulous and the ridiculous simultaneously. Okay. So, yeah. No, absolutely. Yeah. I think the four A's, right? Ambiguity, agility, adaptability, and the ability. Uh, and if you don't, at the end of the day, uh, it, it's. I also think it's like a journey, you know, from being in an ambiguous position to becoming agile, to then adapting, and then eventually, of course, utilizing your ability to the best of your, uh, you know, utilizing your talents to the best of your ability. It's a survival instinct. Yes. Okay. Uh, you think... You swim or you sink. There is no other option. No, absolutely true. Yeah. And uh, I, 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 you know, I did my tenth from Maharashtra board as well, and I took Sanskrit as well. So I know where you're coming from. But I cannot imagine my Sanskrit teacher translating to Marathi and then a translator translating, and so much is lost in the translation as well during that time. It's crazy. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, that time, um, see. What happens is, uh, I've seen so many summers now. I say life is a string of memories. And it is which one you choose to cherish. True, true. The Absolutely. same person will, you know, uh, uh, it's all about your outlook towards life. You know, uh, so uh, you can choose to have happy memories. It's not that my childhood was rosy. Okay. We've had our own share of challenges. Okay. We were not born with a silver spoon. It was a coated one. <laughs> but um, you make the most out of it. Okay, um, Agreed. And, and Agreed. If life throws a lemon at you, you learn to relish the lemon. Yep, yep. What else are you going to do <laughs> otherwise? I don't know. Sorry, but how did you also, I also was wondering, why did you decide to pick up HR instead of the standard modus operandi of marketing in uh, MBA? Okay, so, uh, so when I uh, did my engineering, I was like, um, uh, you know, uh, I was quite, uh, how would I put it? Uh, I wanted to be economically independent. Okay, uh, so after 12, when I got into engineering college, I started taking tuitions. Okay, now the easiest for me was to take kids in 12th class because I'd done my engineering, I'd cracked it. All I had to do was share my notes, talk to them and get it. But I 
uh, deliberately taught kids who were seven to eight years old. Okay. The reason is, you know, their imagination runs wide. Okay. They can be sitting one minute, they'll be here. Yeah, now, the amount you have to come down to relate to them and be accepted by them. You know, uh, that is your power of communication. Okay, so I was able to do that. And secondly, uh, being from the forces background, uh, I mean, dad being in the forces, we were taught to be humble. The Sahaiks and all, I mean, my father was very strict. He, he is uh, orderly, but he's for me. He's not your orderly. So we would polish our own shoes. We'll call him Bhaiya. You know, we have to give him respect. All that thing. So that came very naturally. So I used to, uh, I realized I was as comfortable talking to the CEO or the GMHR or, or the GM out there works as I was with a uh, worker or, a, you know, helper. So that relatability instinct was there. And, you know, uh, uh, that made me decide that, you know, if, I if I'm a natural in this, then, you know, okay, one is sales, but the other is HR rules. Okay. And, and that's what took me to HR. True, true, true. And I, I, I've seen that the best people in human resources are the best teachers as well. So I think that that entire stint which you did also probably made you feel more comfortable about this role as your career path. Yes. In a manner of speaking, yes. Amazing. And you also mentioned that you were the youngest in your group to get your leadership position. Um, I would love to understand that journey that you must have had to really, really work hard for it, right? Plus, um, it would have been really challenging. So when when you're a, a, you know, you're a person who gets to a certain level in life earlier than what other people would do, um, how, how do you navigate that? It's, it must be really challenging. So, you see, even now, okay, uh, India is a very uh, age-conscious society. Yes, absolutely uh, correct. <laughs> okay, so, so uh, that point of time, uh, when I got there, I realized that I had to work doubly hard to prove those people that, you know, I'm not a fluke. Now in HR, what happens is normally that uh, uh, your acceptability okay, is on the basis that how well you are able to contribute to the business. And HR was typically at those time was ki, okay, his letter nikal do, his ki increment kar do, stuff like that. So I took pains to understand the business to pain understand the business so that I could value add to the business. And I simplified HR. I would not hide behind lingos and jingles because business leaders don't have time for that. So if you talk about the concept of business HR, it came in later. I won't say I'm the inventor of it, but I adapted it, adopted it much earlier in my life. So, so you know, so when I would sit in a meeting or something and I would open my mouth, they would think that it is making sense. Okay. I had uh, my colleagues who were a decade elder to me in sales. So initially, you know, the, the, the challenge was just, just faff them off or faff them off with this thing. I had to work really hard to earn their trust. Right. And to be considered as equals. Absolutely. And uh, just to add to that, I think that's also a challenge which I I've seen a lot of people navigate through that if you get to a level in life earlier, you're obviously going to be leading a lot of people who are age wise older than you. So what would be, I, I know this is very off topic, but I would love to hear from you because you've been there in the journey. How have you kind of ensured that they truly take you as a leader and not just like you said, you know, think of it that you got it as a fluke. Okay, so you know, uh, twice or thrice in my career, and and I can say that the first time it happened was that uh, some of my friends who started together, we started together as you know management trainee or something. Uh, in uh, you know a decade later, they started reporting into me different companies. I only offered them. 
you know, the first thing which I did was, see, look, as a leader, please understand, it's a very simple thing. It's all about people. 90% of your time will be on people management. So, respect their competencies. Give them the environment where they can deliver. And all you have to do is work on their strengths. See, everybody has weaknesses. Okay. Now, I can either keep on pinpointing on your weaknesses or I can work on your strengths. My best teams did not have the best guys. They had the guys who could deliver. Yeah. Okay. So for me, delivery is important. So in this case, what used to happen was that typically whenever a meeting would happen, I would never go and sit on the main chair. I would always sit aside. Okay. I would never dominate. I would take pains to explain to them why I am doing this step. And I would, you know, in encourage them to disagree because it's not necessary that every time I take a decision is the right decision. You know, they're also here for a certain reason. And you need to respect their competencies. So if encourage them to give their inputs, then if you see from the business perspective, this will work, not work, then modify it and take pains to explain that why you have overdue it. True, absolutely true. So, so uh, that's how you, you know, see, it's about don't make them feel that you're a boss. You just tell them that, okay, fine. I just happen to approve your leaves. That's about it. Okay. <laughs> true. That too, also, you need to tell me that I'm going. But other than that, you are in equal. It's like King Arthur and his knights. Hmm. So, it's a round table. And trust me, you know, when you, um, when people feel that they're being heard, they may be uh, And you, you will have a work culture or a, or a team which will deliver beyond your expectation, even what you would have. It's just the, that, that, that it's how you manage them. That's where, that's the distinct, you know, difference between a manager and a leader. Absolutely. Absolutely. The difference between a manager and a leader is that a manager will manage, but the leader will bring everyone together, have them deliver to the best of their capabilities and also, you know, himself or herself get involved in that entire process instead of just being the man in the high chair. I love that. And uh, also, since we're talking about managing people, um, what has also happened post COVID is people needs have completely changed. You mentioned that, you know, I think, when you started off your career, HR's job was primarily around paperwork or setting up policies, managing them, but it was never around engaging employees. It was never around retention because there was barely any competition in the market. There was barely any attrition happening. And even from a work perspective, if you look from an MNC's perspective, India was not looked as a uh, place where you're innovating. And India was looked at a, as, a, at, as a back office kind of a setup where you're just having support. So um, all of that has changed over time and hence employee needs have also changed and the way you engage and retain employees has also completely changed. So I'm going to add ask like two questions here. One is what do you think uh, HR leaders should do to address the changing needs of their employees now? And secondly, um, any uh, there's a lot of ambiguity today in the market. How would you recommend that leaders navigate that ambiguity to reduce insecurity, to engage employees, at the same time, not dig deep holes in their pockets? So that's what I would like to ask you next. There's no, uh, there's no fixed answer to it. Otherwise, everybody would have figured it out. Okay. Uh, it, it, you know, the difference between a white collar employee and a blue collar employee is that a white, and I, today that difference also is not there. Everyone has his own mind. You know, I read a quote somewhere, it broadly goes like this that, you know, a man is a jigsaw of needs. Okay, and there's always a missing piece. You become that missing piece and they'll remain with you throughout their life. So if you're asking me on an organizational wide, how will you implement? No, it's a very selective, it's a people to people approach. 
And if you think it's only the job of an HR guy, perhaps not. Okay. It's the job of every person who have people reporting to him or her. Okay. Uh, how do I, I mean, look, today I say is if somebody, even I've gone to that uh, and I'm trying to change, I'll text you, I'll you know, we'll text each other for half an hour, but we'll not speak. Yeah. Um, I say is talk, don't text. That's another way of connecting. Okay. Uh, there are, and today also what's happening is uh, the role of a HR manager, I say is like, is also he's become half a shrink. Because people have a lot of Concerns, genuine, perceived. Okay, I mean, so the perceived ones you can address. The genuine ones you can only mitigate. You cannot eliminate. Now, if it's like, "Hamara kya hoga?" Hey, abhi kuch hua nahi hua na. So why are you bothering about the future? You know, how, how will it look like? Q3 will look like, I mean, did anybody know how it 2020 looked like in 2019? Nobody knew. Till the time COVID hit us. Till the time COVID hit us in the midst of COVID, everybody was saying from, you know, we will now only work from home. There was a mandate out. And suddenly you realize you never had the ecosystem to, where does, see, man essentially is a social feature. The need to communicate is very important. And if we put barriers to communication, you know, we say we use technology, stuff like that. No. Technology has to be an enabler, not a barrier. Uh, Smithy, tomorrow you will remember me for the person I am, not for the technology I used. So that's very true for an HR guy. Idea is you have to be available if people have to speak their heart out. You cannot say, okay, write me a mail. Do There are a lot of things which can get solved by, uh, you know, by talking. Until today, that's the best. No, so, absolutely. absolutely. Yeah, so broadly speaking, I think uh, what's happening is we are over-relying on technology and we're hiding behind technology. Technology should free us to talk, uh, to be more amongst people. I guess that's about it. It's as simple as that. That's true. And the key takeaway from this is technology needs to be an enabler. Technology does not need to become an excuse for not actually dealing with the people problems uh you know people our companies have uh overall related to their employees and that's that's i think an amazing closing note as well uh with that uh we're at the end of uh the podcast and thank you thank you so much mukul for your time it was it was such a pleasure talking to you today and i know we we did everything from school life to philosophy to career to hr to everything and i, I love how how filling this entire session was. I'm sure our viewers will thoroughly enjoy watching it. Thank you so much, Smithy, for having me on your show. Yeah. Thank you so much. Take care. Take care.